Hello, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Builds and Beyond Effective Peer-to-Peer -peer Fundraising. Today, we have pulled together everything you need to know to run the most effective peer-to-peer -peer campaign, whether you're seasoned or it's your first time. And as always, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar and the webinar slides to all registrants via email. We do want to encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation into the questions box on your control panel. And at the end, we'll be having a Q&A session with our panelists. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's panel of experts. Corey Blake is a customer success manager here at Mobile Cause. Corey advises and guides our customers with fundraising and donor engagement strategies. He has worked with countless nonprofits on successful campaigns, and he will be sharing his breadth of fundraising experience during his presentation. Julia Broccoli started at Twin Cities Habitat as the AmeriCorps member in 2014, is now the Education and Group Engagement Associate, working with Women Build and Youth Engagement Programs. Her favorite thing about the Women Build is working alongside other accomplished, inspiring women and learning new construction skills from our regular volunteers. And they have put together an information-packed agenda for you. Corey will share the power of peer-to-peer -peer for your Habitat for Humanity, a blueprint for an effective campaign, and also explore other ideas and you can try. And Julia will share a success story, so sorry, with, from her experience using peer-to-peer -peer at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity that you can replicate for your chapter. So let's get this all started by taking a quick poll. And I'm just going to launch the poll. So our first poll, how successful have you been with using peer-to-peer -peer fundraising? Either very successful, pretty successful, not successful or haven't tried yet? Please enter your responses. Thank you. I'll share this poll now. Well, good news is that we're going to be sharing ideas on how to make sure you are confident in planning your next peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Thank you for all those that volunteered. And now, I'll pass it off to Corey. Corey, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. So uh, there I am. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the power of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. You know, so 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 we want to start with looking at uh, you know basically why peer-to-peer. -peer, you know, what makes it so good. Um, let me see here. I can just hit, there we go. Uh, so, uh, so one of the big things is that peer to peer, of course, relies on peers and, and volunteers to fundraise. So it's really empowering your supporters. Uh, the idea is that they're going to have their own landing pages where they can share those out to their networks and try and fundraise on your behalf. So this gives a unique way for people to uh, to share their story and their connection with your organization. So um, you know it's really valuable that they get to really get involved in the campaign in a unique way. Uh, it gives a good collaborative relationship with your supporters. Um, and so one of the benefits is that it does it widens your net. So. All your supporters, whether they be volunteers, board members, donors, or anybody who's passionate about the organization or just your cause and your mission, they know people who you don't regularly reach. And so the idea, of course, is that they can reach them for you and they basically uh, are gonna be talking about your organization, about the campaign specifically, and about why they want to raise money for it. And so this is helping you reach people who you don't normally reach. It's basically an awareness uh, campaign on one end as well as a fundraising campaign. So um, uh, this is one of the things that makes it so powerful is that it reaches people who you don't normally reach and it, and it inspires them to get involved with your organization on a deeper level. Um, so yeah, whether they have donated in the past, whether they've only ever volunteered and never donated, uh, or whether they just follow your organization but have never really taken a step, uh, this offers the ability to, to get them to that next step, to say, hey, 
especially for donors, like if you, if you ask them over and over again to donate and you're like, I'm feeling a little burnt out on asking this, these people, this group of people. So I want to reach out to them and say, hey, we'd love for you to donate, of course, but um, there's another way for you to help. And if you don't want to volunteer uh, on a build specifically, that's okay too. Uh, we can set you up as a fundraiser and you can or cannot participate in the build if that campaign is specifically about a build, it doesn't have to be. And we'll talk a little bit about some other ideas outside of builds. Um, uh, but uh, they can then create their page. And so uh, their spreading the word is valuable because now they're going to bring in new donors. And now this is just, like I said before, kind of widening the net and bringing in new people you can talk to, you can cultivate into potentially recurring donors or other relationships. Uh, so yes, increase awareness. I kind of mentioned this before. So yeah, this kind of word of mouth. So, you know, when you, when you think about how you hear about things, even outside of nonprofits, like if somebody tells me about a TV show that they're watching, that's going to carry a lot more weight than if I see a, a, a promo spot on TV, because I have a relationship with that person and I trust their judgment more than a paid advertisement. <laughs> so, so this sort of word of mouth and personal recommendation essentially carries so much more weight and value. Um, and so uh, what we recommend for the individual fundraisers is in the way that they promote it to do that on different channels. So if I'm on Facebook and I see my friend post about them trying to raise money, uh, that's going to resonate on some level. Maybe I take the action right then and donate. Maybe I don't. Maybe I'm like, oh, that's good for them. That's cool. But I don't do anything yet. But at least I've heard about it. And then my friend reaches out to me a different way. Maybe they text me. Maybe they call me up. Maybe they send me a direct message on Facebook. But they in some way reach out to me in another method. Now I've heard about it twice. I'm getting a personal uh, interaction from it. And I'm more likely to take action. Uh, whether it's social media, texting, email, things like that. Um, so, uh, so let's take a look at uh, what sort of a, you know what this would look like. What kind of a, an effective campaign could be built? So, what we generally recommend is that the campaign, uh, you know, you want to set it up. You you want to give your fundraisers time to reach out to their friends and family and their contacts, um, but you don't want to make it so long that they just they get burnt out. So it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a balance. Plus we recommend you reaching out and talking with your fundraisers regularly throughout the life of the campaign. So you also don't want to burn yourself out and your fundraisers out from asking. So what we generally recommend is for a campaign to run about a month. That's generally what seems to work the best two to six weeks, you know, on the outside um, certainly have seen longer and it does depend on the specifics of the campaign, whether it's shorter or longer. But on average, that's that's what we see work well. Um, so yeah, building the campaign and the goals, um, uh, everything that you that you uh, how the campaign is built really should be inspired by the campaign and the objective of the campaign. So those goals are going to inform who you ask to be fundraisers. Um, it's going to inform how you frame the language of the ask and the video and things like that that you're using to get the word out. Uh, so you obviously want to be aware of the objective, how much that's going to cost, and how much that would break down per fundraiser. And as you can see, we generally see it average around $600 per donor. So uh, you know, generally we see if 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 you have obviously if you have like 10 fundraisers, you know you know you know what you're what it's likely for you to hit. So this kind of allows you to really piecemeal it down and say, okay, this is our goal. This is how many fundraisers we need to get there. And so how are we going to build this team of fundraisers? Uh, so choosing who you have be your fundraisers obviously is a big deal. Like I said, you want it to be inspired by the goal. So if it is a women's build, obviously, naturally, you'd want to reach out to women. Um, but, you know, uh, professionals, you know, or, or uh, you know, entrepreneurs or, you know, however you're framing it. Uh, if it's not a build, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe you're doing a campaign to open a new restore or to uh, buy new tools in your builds, you know, that sort of thing. And so you'd look for people who that resonates with. Um, and it may be local businesses that you, that you connect with as well uh, that may have a connection in that industry. 
things like that. Um, so he's looking for the the fundraiser's connection to the goal because um, obviously you want them to be passionate about it. And so reaching out to them, we usually recommend inviting them, uh, especially in that first group. Like if you can put together an initial team of five to 10 fundraisers, say we really uh, appreciate all the work you've done for the organization, for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we'd love for you to do to do this. We think you'd be good at it. Um, here's how it would work. If you're interested, you know, you can text in and you can sign up and that sort of thing. You basically just get them set up for that initial team of people. And then when you launch, when the campaign officially launches, you've already got people in place. So you're not starting from absolute zero from day one. Um, and then on that launch day, not only are you sort of trumpeting the campaign to to people on social media and the general public, but those five to 10 people are then, you know, you've release the gates, you know, and, and now they're going to head out into their networks and start talking about it. So this helps with this sort of viral spread of a campaign if it's not just you trying to get people excited about it, but you've already got people talking about it from day one. And certainly something like a hashtag is a great uh, great idea if you can, if you can uh, work that out um, for that sort of social media, you know, getting the buzz going. Uh, so so yeah, once you launch now, you want to keep your fundraisers engaged. I sometimes see where people do all this work to put a really good campaign together. And then it's the launch day, they've got their fundraisers, and then they just sort of, you know, they kind of would just watch. And that's, you know, obviously you won't want to do all that work in the beginning, but you you want to keep them motivated throughout the life of the campaign. You know, if, you're, if it's running a month, uh, you want to set certain goals each week for your fundraisers. Uh, you want to arm them with storytelling tools so that they're not just sort of repeating the same thing over and over again by asking that they've got something new to say about why they're asking. So yeah, you can you can do weekly objectives like, okay, this week, everybody send out five emails to somebody you haven't reached out to yet. Or, you know, share on social media and here's a video that you can share about the family that we'll, we'll be getting this house. You know, so there's ways to arm them with something new, um, so they're, they're just not repeating themselves, and then it sort of people start kind of zoning out on it. You know, they, they they want you want it to remain fresh and exciting throughout the life, and so giving them these these sort of objectives, uh, goals. You know, who can be the first to raise fifty dollars by the end of today? Things like that, where you can challenge them, uh, is exciting for the fundraisers as well because it motivates them and remembers like, oh yeah, I was going to do that. And and now I have an opportunity and, and something to really strive for to do that. Uh, so uh, another idea is to secure a match. So this is really motivating for donors uh, and also helps in the fundraisers talking about the campaign and asking. Um, you can have you could you can just have a match throughout the life of the campaign. But generally, what I recommend and what I think has a little, little bit more urgency to it is to, if you can, secure two separate matches: one that is for the launch day only, and then one that is for the last day only. And so this really helps with the sense of urgency and and sort of the excitement of it. Um, you definitely want to have an end date, a definitive. Like I said, if it's running a month, you know, you really want to be crystal clear from the beginning, like definitively it is ending on the end of, you know, June or whatever. Um, and so uh, having that match on that last day uh, really adds some extra value and really can help for a final push. Um, uh, again, you can partner with local businesses that maybe uh, are affiliated with the campaign in some way or, or in the same, you know, sort of a crossover industry. Um, or it's just a local business you have a relationship with, um, or, or maybe it's just a, a, a generous donor, you know, wh whoever that might be. But it gives you an opportunity to really spotlight whoever that person or company is matching. So you get to really make a day about them in a way. You know, when you're saying, today it's the last day of the campaign, thanks to the generosity of XYZ, we can match every donation today up to, you know, whatever it may be, $5,000 or something. Um, and then obviously link to that donation form or the campaign. Uh, so some secrets for success. Uh, 
So some of these I've sort of referred to, um, but to kind of highlight them, um, these are definitely things I've seen people do that work well, that, that resonate and help with the campaign. Uh, so a bit video, I mentioned that a little bit. So our our platform, you can, as you can see on the little uh, pictures on the on the right there, you can embed a video right onto the page. So uh, that's really good for just being eye catching and, and visual. Um, having a video that like i said it's a personal appeal so um i was like actually yesterday working with an organization and they sent me uh an email like how's this for a video and it was a really nicely well produced psa a 30 second psa spot of their organization and it that that's a great spot you know it's good they have that but it had nothing to do with the actual campaign they were doing but in this instance they were doing a walk uh they were doing a walk run um and it made no mention of the walk, no mention of the goal of what that money would do. It was just about their organization. And again, that's good to, you want to make sure that you are clear about who you are as an organization and Habitat for Humanity. You have an advantage. You're, most people know about you on one, on one level or another. Um, but the video, you know, again, if I'm looking on the right here, this is kind of their, what they see when they initially land on the campaign. So if on Facebook, they see a post and there's a link. They click on it, this is what they're gonna see, whether they're on their phone or, or, or desktop. And so there's the video. And so it makes the most sense and it is more compelling if I click that video and it's talking about the build or the walk or the whatever. Um, and it does not have to be a huge production. It can really be, uh, you know, and I've seen, I've seen people where they will just take their iPhone and, you know, selfie video. And maybe it's the executive director, it's somebody, maybe it's, the family or somebody who's going to benefit from the campaign, but it's just them talking into the camera saying, you know, thank you so much for checking this out. Uh, this is what it's about. This is why we're doing this. This is what the goal will go toward. And if you want to get involved, you can make a donation. You can join us as a fundraiser and, and ask your friends to make a donation, uh, or you can share it or you can do all three, you know, and things like that, where you just, a personal appeal has a lot more, more weight than um, you know slick production. Um, obviously, you want to be able to hear them and see them, but uh, you know it needs to have a certain level of quality. But it does not have to be you know Hollywood production. Um, so yeah, having a video and that and that really goes to the storytelling part of it. That ultimately is why people donate. And so sometimes when the crowdfunding launches and the video or the the impact statement there where it talks about the campaign. I sometimes see organizations where they're a little vague and they just are trying to raise whatever $50,000 and to go to the organization. And it's not really about a specific project or thing. And, you know, that's okay. But again, we see, we see campaigns do much better when it's really about a specific project or campaign or family or beneficiary. And it, that's really transparent. So that the goal means something. It's not like, well, fifty dollars, fifty thousand dollars would be nice. It's we crunch the numbers. We need fifty thousand dollars to make this possible. If we don't raise this, this isn't happening. That way, it really adds to the stakes and the, and the, the urgency. Um, again, going back to that deadline of, you know, by the end of June, if we don't raise this money, this thing isn't happening. And obviously, you want to make it seem possible and hopeful you don't, you don't want to make it doom and gloom but um but you want to let it be clear that there are uh consequences to the campaign that it's going to really make a difference um so next next point uh local businesses yeah so i mentioned this this is a great opportunity to uh bring in new people so if you can approach a local business uh there's a few ways you can do this you can go about it with the matching gift like i mentioned before um but you can also uh if they don't want to or even if they do they may want to have their employees and or customers be fundraisers so we can set up team pages so that would add another tier to the whole campaign where you've got your top level and then you have teams and then you have individual fundraisers under those teams and any amount that the individuals raise it goes up to the team level which of course all rolls up to the whole campaign. Um, people can donate to the team page or they can donate to individuals under the teams. Uh, so yeah, you could have a local business page uh, or team page and uh, that would be something that the business could promote 
And then, of course, the individuals, whether they are employees or customers, could promote their own personal page under the team. Uh, and so um, uh, you can also use this, or the businesses can use this as a promotional tool for themselves. So now, of course, they're talking about the campaign, and but they're going to want to uh, give incentives. You know, so they may tell their customers, if you help us raise this much money, you'll get 10% off your next purchase or something like that. So there's all sorts of ways you can really kind of, you know, cross pollinate these audiences and, and incentivize them to take action and get involved. And it's goodwill for the businesses. And obviously it shows your involvement in the community as well. So it's a really good partnership. Uh, so challenges. So I talked about this a, a little bit earlier, um, but you can really dig into this. I think the first organization I saw this do really well is an organization called Wildlife SOS. And uh, they they do uh, animal rescue, and um, they uh, created a crowdfunding campaign where they had two main campaign wide goals, where it was whoever raises the most money gets, you know, and they had a, a, a thing. They had some they had some artists that they worked with, um, but the prizes can be really anything. It could be just like a badge, which is really just nothing but, you know, bragging rights. Um, um, or it could be actual things, you know, objects or t-shirts or, you know, things like that. Um, and it doesn't have to be a immense value uh, for you to provide it. It's really just, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's just the, the sake that they did it. Um, but yeah, you can raise the most money for the entire campaign. And then number two was how many donors the, the person that got the most number of donors, regardless of amount. So maybe somebody got like, you know, a hundred five dollar donations, you know, and then somebody else got two ten thousand dollar donations, you know, so each of those would win separately. Um, and then you can have weekly challenges, which I was kind of referring to earlier, where you say, okay, who can get the first donation? Uh, who can who can who can increase their donation by a hundred dollars first this week? something like that, you know, all these different ways to incentivize who can get the first recurring donor. Um, you know, there's a lot of creative ways you can do to, to, uh, to give them something, give them a reason to reach out to their, to their friends and family that week. Uh, so, um, so yeah, we're talking about this, about ideas beyond build. So, uh, you're going to hear about a great example of, of a build in just a second. Uh, but there are other types of campaigns you certainly can do. Um, uh, we've seen happen. I mentioned walks and runs. I know habitats don't generally do those, but if that comes up, you can, um, so sponsoring an individual or family. So this might be a different way to do a similar thing as a build. Uh, if you, again, if for people who don't actually want to volunteer and do the build, that might be a way to do a campaign where you say, help us sponsor this family to get a house. And, uh, then it's all about that family and raising that money to fund the house. And then, you know, obviously you've got your volunteers worrying about the actual build, uh, but the fundraiser doesn't have to worry about that part. Um, year end campaign. So I've seen this, I, and I, I actually like this. So a campaign that launches on Giving Tuesday, which is uh, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, and then it runs until December 31st. Uh, so you've got, it's about a month, perfect time length, and you are hitting the two biggest giving days of the year. But far and away, those two days, Giving Tuesday and December 31st, are uh, we see on our, on our platform and, and throughout the industry, it's sort of a, uh, you know, backed up as well, that, that, that's a huge spike. So definitely recommend if you don't normally do a year end, uh, campaign that you should definitely explore that whether it's, whether it's peer to peer or otherwise, but I think peer to peer is a great way to do it. Uh, fund a particular project. So I, yeah, I mentioned this. So yeah, we're opening our first restore or we're expanding it or, you know, repairs to, to the, to, to the building. Um, maybe there's a house that was built and, you know, you want to help with the upkeep. I don't, I don't think you ever do that, but you know, some sort of thing where it's, it's a, it's a one-off. It's a, it's a, it's might be something you don't normally do. Um, it's not like a seasonal campaign, but it's something you need maybe for an urgency. Maybe it's related to a disaster is another thing too. Um, uh, you know, certainly weather related disasters and things like that, where you can uh, fund to help out in the community. And so again, yeah, there'll be a project where you're saying, 
okay, this thing happened, we're taking action. So for the month of May, we are raising X number of dollars. And by doing that, we're going to be able to do X, Y, Z. And, uh, and yeah, the more you can really translate the dollar values into things, you know, something like that where it's a big project, you could even break it down to if you give a hundred dollars, that means, you know, 10 hammers or, you know, I don't know, so, you know, some sort of specific thing that comes from a specific donation level. Uh, specific storytelling. I, I talked a lot about that before. Um, I can't stress that enough. I'm a big uh, proponent of that. Um, the heart is what moves people to donate, you know, and that's really ultimately what it's all about. It's why people get involved with nonprofits. It's why ultimately people choose your nonprofit versus the hundreds and thousands of others. Uh, so there's something about your mission and that story, that 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 spe special project that resonates to them personally. And so the fundraisers should always lead with that as the individuals, as you're coaching your individual fundraisers, you should you know, let them know that that's how they should ask, um, that they should share why it matters to them because that's why their friends and family are going to respond is because they care about that person that you know if i'm the fundraiser my network presumably hopefully cares about me and if i uh am passionate about something and i'm describing why it matters to me they're going to respond because of my relationship because of their relationship with me um and then that of course goes into the storytelling of the actual campaign as well as you as the organization promoting this campaign out to the public, you, you know, the storytelling has to be front and foremost. And then, yeah, specific end date. I mentioned that again, this is, should be from the start that it's known that the campaign, we only have this much time to do this thing. Um, again, helps with urgency. Um, it just makes the, it helps with making the whole thing crystal clear. If there's any vagaries about like what the thing's about, when it's, when it's ending, where the money's going, people kind of start to lose a little bit of confidence. And it can be just little minor things here and there where they don't know why they didn't ultimately donate it. They just, eh, and they kind of moved on. And so all these little things were, were help in building confidence in this thing is happening and this is how it's happening and when it's happening. And it's going to happen because of you. Um, so that's uh, my portion, I believe. Uh, yes. So uh, thanks so much for letting me uh, babble on to you. I hope some of that was helpful. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat and I'll be uh, around at the end to answer any questions. Thank you, Corey, for sharing such great information and ideas. And next up, we have Julia. Julia, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia. I work at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area of Minnesota. Um, so I manage our Women Build program. So I'll start by just giving you a little bit of information on how the program works, because that'll make more sense when I get into the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, but we build, we essentially build the equivalent of two houses with Women Build volunteers each year. So we build from around June to mid-October. Um, and we do this using what we call team leaders. So we recruit team leaders from, they could be individuals that have a group of friends that they want to bring out. They could be um, one woman in a, at an organization, at a business, at a faith-based organization, whatever it is. Um, so they choose to lead their team. And with that, they commit to recruiting 15 volunteers to come out build, and build for a day. And then they commit to raising $1,500. Um, so a few things that we do to have a successful peer to peer fundraising experience for us and for our volunteers, um, we start by getting everybody really excited. So we do a kickoff event for Women Build each year. Um, it's actually this coming Monday, so we'll have about 60 people come. Um, we have refreshments um, for those of you who participate in National Women Build Week. This year we're doing our Lowe's how-to clinic at the kickoff so that we have volunteers there that can learn how to use power tools. Um, but this is most of all a really, really good opportunity for our volunteers to meet each other. Um, so our newer volunteers can and donors can talk to those that have been around for you know 10 years 
and get some information, expertise, and ideas from them. Um, and it gives people kind of that excitement to go out and then talk to their friends to get involved, whether that's through volunteering or donating. Um, we also make it really easy for volunteers and donors to set up their peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page. So we'll send out a team leader handbook to every team leader, uh, which has information on women build, on recruiting volunteers, and then of course on setting up their fundraising page. Um, so it's a, it has step-by-step -step instructions, walking them through the setup, how to personalize it, um, and then some ideas on where they should share it and with who they should share it. Uh, so we do include the social media side, I'd say based on the demographics of our Women Build volunteers, most of them are sharing it through email. Um, so with that, we provide a few templates on how to share you know, the day, um, what's expected of volunteers, and then how to share that fundraising page. Um, so one of my favorite ways that one of our team leaders does it is she has a list of you know, 50 people that she wants to invite. And she'll send out an email that says all oh, the build information, the date of the build, and then here are two ways you can get involved. You can come out and actually build with us, um, or if you aren't able to make it to the build, maybe construction's not your thing, or you work that day, um, please support us financially. Um, so giving everybody an opportunity to be involved with Women Build, even if they aren't all that keen on getting out on site. Um, Using the team leaders is really helpful for me and for our staff because that means that the team leaders are doing a lot of that communication for us. So we provide them with you know, ideas on how to promote it, where to promote it, um, but it's really on them to reach out to their groups, um, their networks, and get people to, to get involved. Um, and then the clear fundraising target and purpose. So. Um, Corey touched on this earlier, that it's important for people to know what they're donating to and why. Um, so we have a $1,500 sponsorship level for each one-day volunteer opportunity um, for our women bill. So that's pretty on par with our other sponsorship levels. Our corporate one is a $2,000. Um, so, uh, you know, Wells Fargo would donate $2,000 to volunteer um, per day. But women build is the same as our faith and youth volunteer groups. Um, so they know that they're supporting their build day, they're providing materials for that day, um, and they're making the mortgage more affordable for our families. Um, we don't have as clear of an end date, I wouldn't say, um, because we have volunteers going out to site, you know, for five or six months throughout the year with Women Build. Um, so each fundraiser probably sets up their page about a month before their build day, and they'll send it out to their groups. Um, and then you know, after their build day, they kind of cease to uh, ask people to volunteer or to fundraise. Um, but that $1,500 is also really nice because we ask our team leaders to recruit 15 volunteers, so that's the $100 a volunteer. So a lot of our team leaders will reach out and say um, to their actual volunteer group, please join me to volunteer and please you know, support the day by also uh, sponsoring $100 per person. And then that gets them pretty easily to their goal. Um, a few other things that I've no noticed are really successful and helpful for our team leaders, um, matching donations. So Instead of having like one corporation have provide a match for all of our team leaders and all of our donors, we have quite a few team leaders that will say to their teams and donors that they will match their donation. So if their friends and volunteers raise six hundred dollars, um, the person who's leading that team will donate six hundred dollars and they'll get over the you know, up to the closer to the goal. Um, so that's how we. I've seen that work really, really well um, with a lot of our, our team leaders. Um, it also shows that our team leaders are committed and you know they're not just asking their friends to donate because they wanna be out there. Um, so having that match shows that they're really invested in the day. I'd say that all of our team leaders donate something before they send out their page. 
Um, so it's been, you know, even if it's 10, 50 bucks, um, showing that they are also fundraising for their day. Um, having retain, returning fundraisers, so these are kind of those champions that Corey talked about earlier. Um, having people that we know are going to come out and they already have their list of donors that they'll send their page out to. Um, so they'll, you know, easily hit that 1500 or, or more. Um, so that raises our total um, so that other volunteers can see that that's possible. Um, it also helps us be a little bit flexible with our fundraising goal. So we tell everybody that it's 1500, but we aren't all that strict in enforcing that. So we do have a number of groups that will raise you know, anywhere from five to a thousand dollars, five hundred to a thousand dollars, and not make it to fifteen hundred. But we know that we have some of those groups that consistently raise over the minimum fundraising. Um, so we're pretty flexible with that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, asking those that can't fill to donate instead, so that they're still involved in the day. Um, and then sending the donation link out in their thank you email. So after uh, people leave their day, we obviously encourage them to thank their volunteers for coming out for the day and participating with Women Build. Um, and we also encourage them to send that donation link out. So, you know, they've been asking people to donate ahead of time, but sometimes after somebody spends a day on the site, as you all know, you know, it can be really impactful to be actually participating in the build. Maybe they need family, maybe they have a great day with other women that they didn't know beforehand. Um, so sending out that donation link can get some last minute donations or you know, saying, thanks for coming out, we're at $1,400, help us get to 15, um, can be useful. Um, also sending it out with pictures after, so maybe posting on Facebook with a picture of your group standing in front of the house um, and saying, you know, they're still five days left to donate or whatever, um, so that people can see that you did it and, and that they can still give. Um, and we also finally use the offline donation capability pretty frequently. Um, so mobile calls will let you, the administrator, um, kind of go in and add donations to a, a fundraiser's page. So we have a lot of volunteers that aren't all, tech, all that tech savvy. So they'll, we offer the option for our volunteers to send in donations to, to our office. And then I can go on and add that to a team's page. And um, we also have people who like, bring a check to site. Um, so we can add that after so that it shows up in our, our total and the team's total, um, which I think our team leaders really appreciate having that flexibility to do it online or offline. Um, so last year we raised thirty thousand dollars of eighteen fundraisers, so that's a little over sixteen hundred dollars per fundraiser. Again, some of those did not meet their goal, but then there were a number that were in like the three to four thousand dollar range, um, which helps even that out. Um, I think that's my last slide, um, but I will stick around, and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Julia, for sharing your success. That is really valuable information for the other Habitat of Humanity chapters that are on the webinar today. And now that we've shared all this valuable information, we wanted to make sure we help you to take your next peer-to-peer -peer campaign to the next level. I'm going to launch a second poll. If you can just do respond to the poll. And the poll is, would you like to speak to an expert on how to implement an effective peer-to-peer -peer campaign for your next event or build? So I'll just give everyone a moment to do a quick response. And our three choices are yes, maybe, or no, I'm not ready. Excellent, and thank you for those that voted today. Now we're going to switch our gears for a few minutes to answer any questions uh, from our audience. Let's see, our first question is, Corey, can you talk more about how to use peer-to-peer -peer for Teams? 
Yeah, great. Um, yeah, teams. I mean, I think the example I specifically specifically gave was around uh, partnerships with local businesses, um, but that it doesn't have to be that. Um, I mean, I think actually the way uh, that the, the example I was just being described is that the team pages, if I remember right, from that campaign is that uh, each team captain is basically a team page, and then they have their team of builders as individual fundraisers under them. So that's an, another way to do it. Um, you can also, you know, any cluster of people, really. Um, so going back to a walk and run example, sometimes people will walk and run in a group, you know, so any kind of, um, you know, group of people, basically, yeah, you can set them up, have a team captain who is going to be the person who can control that team page. They can, you know, write the call to action on there. They can set the goal and uh, upload pictures, things like that. And then they would be able to then uh, from that page, share it to their members and say, okay, cool here, click here, sign up as a fundraiser. And then if they join under, if they become a fundraiser from that team page, they are automatically placed under that team. And, um, and then, yeah, the individuals appear with their own individual page that they can control just as if they were not in a team page. The only difference for the individuals is that any amount they raise gets rolled up to that team level. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope that answers that question. But basically, it's any 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 group of people. So whether it's a formal like company or business, uh, or it's an informal just group of people that want to participate in the in the campaign together, um, that's absolutely fair. I've also seen it. I mean, just going outside of Habitat for Humanity, but schools will use it where they'll just have like like sports teams will be a team. So that's another thing too. If you approach a school and say, hey, if your if you know your sport if your football team wants to participate in the build. We can give you a team page, and then you can be individuals under that team. Thanks, Corey. Our next question, Julia. Julia, do you have any tips on how to go about securing a match? Um, so we haven't used a, you know, a corporate or an individual that will match all of our donations um, for Women Build. We do use them for think, Give to the Max Day and our year end and um, a few other things. I haven't really been involved in getting any of those. Um, the ones that have come up from Women Build have been just individuals um, that are leading their team that also that want to do the match. So they'll donate $1,500 if the team raises $1,500. And those have all been people that have self-selected to do that. It started... I think maybe three or four years ago, one woman decided to do that, um, and then that kind of spread. So I think we have four women that lead teams now that will match whatever their volunteers raise. Um, and most, I mean, that kind of spread amongst them. So having that kickoff event has been helpful that one of them picked up that tip from the, from the first woman and then, you know, spread from there. Thanks, Julia. Our next question, Corey, can you go into more detail about how to get your fundraisers to participate in the challenges? Yeah, great. Uh, again, it depends on how much you build this up, if there are prizes attached to each challenge. Um, but basically, you'd want to assemble your team and, and be upfront, like, okay, this is, this is what's going to be involved by becoming a fundraiser. We're going to have these challenges. You can win prizes if you want, things like that. Uh, so that can help in recruiting people because they're like, oh, I can get a, you know, a T-shirt or whatever. Um, but during the campaign, uh, what I would recommend is each week uh, an email goes out saying that, you know, great job last week. Maybe spotlight one or two people who did great and, and uh, you know, as, a, as an example of like, yeah, people are doing this, you know, for those that are maybe haven't done much um, and then say, OK, this week's challenge is who can bring in the, our first recurring donor. Whoever does this will get this. And of course, if there is no prize attached, you just issue the challenge and, you know, there's no prize. It's just, you know, you, you'll get called out the next email, basically, and thanked. Um, 
And then also our system, you can text out to your fundraisers as well. So I think it's also a good idea. Uh, text has a higher read rate than email. So um, you'd probably want to follow that up maybe midweek saying, uh, you know, good so far. We don't have our winner yet for the challenge. You know, that sort of idea, just sort of a follow up to the email. Um, I see organizations where they will flip it and they'll have uh, the text go out at the beginning of the week as a way to announce the challenge and then maybe an email as a follow up. Uh, you know, and sometimes they just do text. It just kind of depends on the culture of your fundraisers. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, that's basically how that would look. Great, Corey, thank you. And thanks for everyone. If you do happen to have any more questions, you can email us at marketing at mobilecause.com and we'll get back to you with an answer. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, you can speak directly with an expert at Mobile Cause, or you can call 888-661-8804, or visit mobilecause.com, who we serve Habitat for Humanity. And once again, thank you to our presenters today, and thank you all for attending. You will receive the webinar recording and slide presentation shortly. Thanks, have a great day.